in the age of wonder. Another world, another time. His life was green and good. Come touch me like I'm an ordinary man. Have a look in my eyes. Underneath my skin, there is a violence. It's got a gun in its hands. Ready to make, ready to make, ready to make sense of anyone, anything, anyone, anything, anyone. What with the game, Cyberpunk 2077, uh, about to get a, a new teaser soon. Uh, let's look at the role playing game upon which it is based. This is the 2020 edition of Cyberpunk, which is the definitive edition. There was an earlier edition called Cyberpunk 2013, which was released in a black box, a kind of much more traditional release of a game at the time. Box sets were, were all the rage. 2020 came later and was a much more polished and playable game, but 2013 was pretty successful. It was one of the last RPGs I bought in a Games Workshop store before they went entirely corporate. This is a later edition of the 2020 game with some of the Spanish edition art in it which they decided was so good they'd bring into the next print run of, of Cyberpunk. And it's also my second copy of the game because the original one wore out which is why this one is laminated. So you can tell we played the ever-living fuck out of Cyberpunk. Not so much Shadowrun, keep your elves out of my Cyberpunk, but for those of us who were of a mm, harder sci-fi bent uh, Cyberpunk was was the game to play, and it was it was everywhere, and it's a really important and foundational game in many ways, because a lot of the tips and so on that it had for creating atmosphere while playing and so on, also the kind of darker side of gaming, the more modernistic approach, the you know, the near future setting and so on. Without that, we couldn't really have had Vampire or a lot of the other kind of dark wave of games that there were through the 90s. So it's a really important and, and seminal game that we played the hell out of. The 2013 edition had a lot of kind of Nagel uh, style art, uh, which was which was pretty good because it was Cyberpunk is very much a kind of 80s vision of the future. Um, so yeah, that, that made a lot of sense to choose that kind of iconic 80s style for everything, but that makes Cyberpunk now very much a kind of retro future, <laughs> um, weirdly, in a way that Steampunk is almost. That kind of 80s aesthetic, that 80s sensibility, that 80s style, uh, it's kind of a, a vision of the future that's, that's frozen in time, like a lot of old science fiction. So I'm hoping when it comes to 2077, I'm hoping it's kind of a, a soft reboot rather than a, than a continuation of the timeline because that just wouldn't wouldn't really make sense. There's too many assumptions and things that's in the background of Cyberpunk that no longer make sense. Uh, <laughs> that often no longer make sense when you go back and look at the fiction that inspired it because you know, the Japanese are not in charge of everything. It's like, it's like when you look at Blade Runner and you see the, the companies that have died on the billboards and the blimps and everything else, and it just kind of throws you out. And there were assumptions in the background of, of Cyberpunk as well that no longer make sense. In a similar way to Twilight 2000 had to be very much updated because it no longer made sense to think about you know, a conflict with the USSR. So if you wanted to keep that kind of plausibility of background, you had to change things. And I think Cyberpunk needs to do that as well. There were technological assumptions as well, like the amount of memory and processing power in computers uh, wasn't conforming to Moore's Law. Uh, cell phones were these gigantic, hyper-expensive bricks that you had to pay for all kinds of hardware options and so on. on. So I just don't think it would make particular sense. Now, system-wise, um, Cyberpunk was very simple and very adaptable. It was derived from systems used in Mekton and so on. I, for the life of me, I can't remember the, the name, but it used to be a generic system. Uh, Interlock, that's it, Interlock. 
Uh, but this was a much better, more full iteration of interlock that really kind of made sense. It used a d10, and if you rolled a 10, that was a critical, and you kept rolling and, and adding on. So it was kind of cinematic because it didn't have a, a bell curve, it had a flat probability line. But despite that, it still felt pretty hard and gritty. Not that there weren't problems uh, with it. The interface between armor and weapons never quite worked, and pretty much everyone I know house ruled <laughs> in one way or another. Uh, but despite that, it was a tremendously successful game. You would choose a class. Uh, Solo is like a mercenary or or fighter. Uh, Netrunner, the sort of yeah, hacker. I mean, look, look, look at the cell phones. Uh, Netrunner's a hacker who actually interfaces into the system, and so on. And each of these classes, though they're really very loose classes, had access to a special skill which made them especially good at whatever it was that they were fix fixed upon. So solos could always pretty much steal initiative <laughs> and go first. And uh, given the guns and so on that they had, that usually meant half the fight was over. Netrunners were particularly good at, at hacking, and so on and, and so on. But it didn't feel like a class system, because these were just like advantages, and a lot of people house ruled that you could take other specialist skills if you wanted to. And it, it all worked fine. Uh, the system really doesn't need changing even today it's a it's a perfectly good system if you wanted to make it grittier maybe you could use 2d6 instead of a d10 perhaps the only real problem is that interface with the with the armor and again that's easy to house rule so you know there's there's ways to get around that but built on this fairly simple and pretty generic system uh, was this was this whole world these cybernetics cyber psychosis from having too much cybernetics guns genuinely felt different in the system and the tweaks and customizations that you could do made it made it worthwhile the hacking is always a problem in these kind of games because a netrunner is essentially your wizard uh, <laughs> able to do things with the surroundings around you activate weapons hack vehicles and whatever else that you need doing, open locks, all, all the rest, but the subsystem that takes them into the net is always a distraction because you have to play that out and that means everyone else around the table who isn't a netrunner basically isn't doing anything while you're doing that and this becomes particularly disruptive during combat where you have to swap back and forth with the netrunner getting a certain number of turns for every one that goes on in the real world, and it does get uh, difficult. The Netrunner card game originally came out of Cyberpunk, and there were rules in a later supplement for using the card game to handle the hacking. So you could basically set up um, a, a data fortress or whatever for the Netrunner to hack, and leave them alone to, <laughs> to play with the cards while you carried on playing with everyone else, and then they could report while they when they finished it. You know, an element of trust. Uh, was involved there of course, but this is also a problem in Shadowrun and any other game that uses this kind of uh, in-depth and in-character virtual hacking system, yeah, that that always, always happens. Um, see, the cyber psychosis thing was that the, the more robotics you built into your body, the less human you became, and that whether directly or not, clearly seems to have inspired uh, things in Vampire and so on. And as I said before, the, the hints and tips on how to make a more immersive game, like lighting, music, uh, focus on character and, and drama and so on, while it was only really words and not particularly built into the systems other than cyber psychosis, you know, it, it was really, really important and establishing that background for the games that were to come later on. Okay, let's see what's supposed to have happened in 2018. Brushfire wars erupt in Eastern Europe. ESA mission launched the Jupiter. Well, I guess Russian expansionism needs that, but uh, that's a little <laughs> ambitious. 
So the background, you could take it any way you wanted. It was still essentially a generic system if you wanted it to be. The background on a macro scale didn't really play into the game that much, but the the background on a smaller scale uh, in the main setting, Night City, that, that did, that mattered. You got to know that city. It had a, a fantastic supplement that detailed the city block by block by block um, and all the characters and so on. You really, if you played in that area, you really got to know that city like it was a real city. Another thing they seem to have missed was actually the internet, which was weird because Cyberpunk predicted the internet. Uh, they had this idea for things called scream sheets, which were uh, like street boxes that would rapidly print newspapers rather than just delivering it to you directly. Yeah, it seems an odd, odd thing to miss, but I guess uh, predicting the future is always, always difficult, isn't it? But yeah, the political background, the scientific background and so on, it doesn't make a huge amount of sense um, today. Yeah, it kind of did then, obviously exaggerated and so on, but I really do hope that 2077 it is, is a soft reboot and re-examines a lot of the assumptions and so on and makes it more uh, plausible, because I think that's an important part of especially near future science fiction. You need to be able to see how you got there from here. So I really hope they do do that. I mean, it's an overt corporatocracy um, in the cyberpunk background, which is kind of pretty much what we do have, uh, a plutocracy with you know, multinational companies and so on operating uh, and controlling our governments and so on with their, with their power but in cyberpunk it's much more direct there are corporate armies it's it's blatant and open whereas in real life they tend to act a bit more behind the scenes using their influence and and so on to manipulate rather than acting directly and openly but the rise of private military companies pmcs and everything else you know these are these are things that are in cyberpunk but just turned up. So I'm really looking forward to the computer game because this was really was a, a, a seminal work and a massively influential game and one which we played to death so I'm nervous to see what happens with the computer game because Mike Pondsmith, the, the, the writer, uh, the creator of Cyberpunk and, and Backton and other things, he has worked in computer games but he's also responsible for Cyberpunk 3rd Edition. And we don't talk about Cyberpunk 3rd Edition. It doesn't exist in the same way that Highlander 2 doesn't exist. I'm sure he's been heavily involved in CD Projekt Red's Cyberpunk 2077. Uh, and let's hope that he's got his, got his shit together for that one. Postmortem Studios is my personal imprint where I create role-playing games, stories, card games, board games, and more. You can get them at RPG Now, DriveThruRPG, Lulu.com, and some on Amazon. Role-playing games to die for.